Hey there, welcome to The Uplift. We've got a great show for you, a great cast of characters as well, and it's going to be a great day, beginning with a mother who wanted to help her daughter and other college students find peace, and she came up with a clever and very cute way to do it. Also, a college athlete making history in the game of baseball. Pretty sweet swing there. And a baby who survived the devastating earthquakes in Turkey was left without a mother, or so they thought. Stick around for answers, plus researchers who have some interesting neighbors in Antarctica. You're going to get a close-up look at the emperor penguins they're studying. Plus, a little girl with cerebral palsy who found a role model just like her. CBS News was there when they met for the very first time. We got all that, plus your heartwarming videos, the ones you just need to see. You know what you're watching, The Uplift. Hey there, I'm Tony DeCopel. This is The Uplift. It's a show that lifts you up for at least the next 30 minutes. I would say you and me as well. And we are going to begin here with a mom in Wisconsin who saw her college-aged daughter stressed during the pandemic and she wanted to do something to help her and also other students in town. Caitlin O'Kane has a story. A cozy cafe in Whitewater, Michigan is serving up more than just coffee. They provide cuddles and cuteness too, with cats. Natalie Serna, a former nurse and single mom, was inspired to open Barista Cats Cafe to help the college kids at nearby University of Wisconsin. My daughter goes, and she was a big, big part of my inspiration. During COVID, she was locked in her dorms freshman year. Why I chose Whitewater? Because it was so hard for her and to see these kids struggle for their mental health. I don't want to see the kids have to go through that. Natalie says that cats have a healing benefit and she wanted to bring that to college kids and senior citizens in Whitewater. It really reduces stress, it reduces anxiety, and it that not only for the humans, but for the cats. She got help from Wisconsin Women's Business Initiative Corporation, which helps small business owners reach their dreams. And now she's helping customers and local cats. The Humane Society provides all the cats for the cafe, meaning they're all up for adoption. So these cats often go into the shelter and they are shut down. They're scared, they're depressed, but when they come here, they come out of their cages and their personalities really shine. In just over a year, more than 30 cats have been adopted by customers who get to bring those feline healing powers home with them from Barista Cats Cafe. Beautiful piece. From one beautiful story to another, we're going to introduce you now to a young woman making college baseball history. Here's Meg Oliver. Watch out, boys of summer. Oh! There's a new kid in town, and she means business. This was my goal throughout high school, to play collegiate baseball regardless of the division. 19-year-old Olivia Pichardo made history recently as the first woman to make a collegiate Division I baseball team, an outfielder for Brown University in the Ivy League. I knew that I wanted to play college baseball, but I also wanted to go somewhere that had academics that fit the grades that I had in high school. Pichardo chose Brown with a plan for a walk-on tryout. She approached things with calm. Grant Achilles is the team's head coach. How many women have reached out to you to try and try out for your program? There have been a handful, a handful since Liv, uh, certainly none before. She uh, was the first? Yes, she was the first. How would you describe her as a baseball player? So she's very meticulous with her preparation and she's a contact hitter that wants to put the ball on the ground and play solid defense in the outfield. The dusty baseball diamonds of Queens, New York have been a part of Pichardo's life as long as she can remember. Who taught you how to play baseball? Uh, it was my dad. I kind of inherited his love for the <laughs> game, and he knew that he wanted his kids to play baseball. So it all started here in Queens? All right here, and this is the path that we took to the Little League field. Olivia's dad, Max, grew up playing baseball in the Dominican Republic and was eager to share the sport with his kids. He got Olivia on the diamond when she was only four. He still has her first bat, pink and yellow. So it looks so small now, <laughs> but uh, on the field way back there, when she uh -huh. said it, when you play, when you're the littlest, she would come out to, to the plate uh -huh. and she would slam the crap out of the bat <laughs> on, on the home plate. 
Olivia became a pitcher and outfielder and was able to hold her own with older boys. As a seventh grader, she made the high school boys varsity team. That was always the thing that I look forward to. Like, oh, practice at the end of the day today. A game at the end of the day. I'm going to pitch today. I'm so excited. While many girls take to softball, it was never a consideration for Pichardo. She graduated high school with a sizzling fastball and a sparkling GPA. And while Pichardo has always been a standout, she's also always found a way to fit in. Just ask her Brown teammates. The first thing I was impressed by was just how she threw the ball. It's a good sign of just what a baseball player will be. I was also impressed. I hadn't really played with any girls since Little League, and I was pretty excited to see what, what she could do out here. As a freshman walk-on, Olivia wasn't guaranteed any playing time. But on March 17th, with Proud Papa filming from the stands, yeah! Pichardo became the first woman ever to bat in a Division I game. It was a ground out, but it was history. What do you want other little girls out there to know that are playing baseball right now? I guess I would tell them they should be playing the sport that they love for as long as they want to play. If you can play, let them play. That's a great swing she's got there. Coming up after the earthquake in Turkey, a baby survived the, for days underneath the rubble. Days. Her rescue, nothing short of a miracle. But it's what happened next that may be even more miraculous. Stick around. You're watching The Uplift. Time now for those heartwarming videos, the ones you just need to see. This one comes from Georgia, where an elderly dog named Binky disappeared three years ago. The 18-year-old pup ended up six hours away from home in, in a completely different state, in fact. Dorchester Paws, that's a shelter in Somerville, South Carolina, used his microchip to identify his owner and a volunteer then drove Binky all the way back home. What you're seeing on your screen now is the emotional moment when his mom got him back after three years. Hi. Oh, goodness. Oh. Hey, buddy. Oh, my goodness. You're home, bud. No, oh, that is a really sweet one there. Love that. All right, recent earthquakes in Turkey, they left a devastating trail of destruction, killed more than 50,000 people. Ponder that for a moment. And in that darkness, we do say there was a symbol of light. After surviving 128 hours in the rubble, a little baby was saved. Here's Natasha Larno with the story of survival. When an earthquake ravaged Turkey, this baby girl was buried underneath the rubble for 128 hours. And yet, she survived. She was about a month and a half old at the time, and she was put into state care. It was believed that her mother died. But about two months later, a family member reached out to officials claiming the mom was still alive and that she was being treated at another hospital. So she took a DNA test and it was a match. And after 54 days apart and countless volunteers and strangers helping, the baby was reunited with her mom. They are the only survivors from their family. But now, the miracle baby is finally back in her mom's arms. The mother, a survivor. The baby, a miracle. Now back together. Mm. Love there finds a way. Coming up, a trip to Antarctica to get a close-up look at Emperor Penguins. Plus, meet a five-year-old girl who connected with an important role model a role model who lives all across the country, clear across it. See the moment they met for the very first time in person. It's been more than a year now since the war in Ukraine started. Millions of people have begun to flee their homeland, the country of Ukraine. And last year, CBS Minnesota's Aaron Hassan Zadeh met a family from Ukraine just after they arrived in these United States. She recently found them again to hear about the life they're building here. 
Literally, I took the shirt off my back, some documents, and ran away. We first met Alina, Nutella, and Valentina one year ago when it was fresh. So I want to go home. I really want to go home. Their homes in Mariupol, Ukraine, destroyed, so they ended up here in Minnesota. We escaped there in, in great fear. One year later. My husband is here. He arrived. My children arrived. Thank God that we are all together now. Most of their family is here, settling into their new lives. With a new family member, Milo. He is the most important development currently. Milo, Milo. Milo was a surprise gift for Alina's daughter, who's thriving at school and in the neighborhood. They're playing together across the fence throw toys across the fence to each other. She even met another girl from Mariupol in her class. Nutella, who was a dentist in Ukraine, is taking classes at an ESL school, working on English medical terminology to hopefully eventually work in that field again. And speaking of fields... When it was the summer, I was always gardening and doing a little bit of farming. I would grow vegetables, tomatoes, flowers, cucumbers. Valentina is thriving. Wonderful medical care. I really love the nature here. Excellent nature. I love this winter. So, so beautiful. I am very satisfied. I'm very fulfilled. I feel good. Because of the timing of their arrival in the States, they didn't qualify for certain programs. They're parolees. DHS tells us their status in the U.S. was just extended one more year. This conflict is not going to stop in the near future. And because of the fact that even if it does, as we've heard from this family in Mariupol and by and large other parts of Ukraine, it's been leveled down to a field. Attorney Nadia Royfi gets calls from families like this on a daily basis. They're looking for guidance to eventually solidify a more permanent status here in the U.S. Individuals, as we heard, want to work. They want to belong. They want to improve their English, their skill set. They really feel safe and happy here and really want to contribute. But what do we tell them as immigration practitioners or as a country? For now, we still need to go through a lot to feel really like we belong, that this is ours. This family will enjoy the simple joys of being together, being safe, building towards something new. And we have now many friends here. It's so valuable. Many people are helping us. Perhaps not something they chose, but something they embrace. We really want to thank every single person that aided us in this journey. Thank you, everybody, for all your support, for your friendship. We do have hope. Well, it's not Ukraine anymore, but it is home now. We wish them the best. All right, it's not yet summer here in the U.S., but in Antarctica, believe it or not, summer has just ended. And the researchers from San Jose who spent the season there, well, they were living next to some very interesting neighbors. CBS Bay Area's Brian Hackney brought back this report. But Hamilton has picked up some snow. The, the camera started to snow here where we are in Red 17 is just a mess. It was a real nightmare trying to get back down because the ice freezes. Really on the unusual snow. meteorological conditions for us. You don't usually see in the forecast snow in the Santa Cruz Mountains. So we're at Cape Crozier to study emperor penguins. They're great neighbors. They're really curious birds and kind of wondering what kind of weird penguin you are. <laughs> it's my first time on the ice stepping off the helicopter. I almost cried because I was so happy. <laughs> this year our goal is to instrument 32 birds. Um, we're hoping to learn where they're going, how deep they're diving, how hard they have to work to get their food. It involves a lot of logistics. So we get up in the morning, pack up our research gear, and we head out and then just catching penguins. Once we find the penguin that we want to capture, we surround it. The bird doesn't really know what to do, kind of stands still, and we're able to get within three or four feet of it. And then we have these long hooks, kind of like a shepherd's crook, that we just um, can hook around the bird and pull it towards us and then basically give the bird a big hug. So we spent a lot of time in the beginning deploying tags, getting a flipper measurement, getting a blood sample if possible, and if they've got a transmitter on them. So we have an antenna and we can scan, and when it goes boop, 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 <laughs> we know we have a penguin. 
We capture these devices from the backs of these penguins. We download the data and it allows us to do really interesting things such as know where the penguins go while they're at sea. Whether it was standing, if it was swimming, we're actually able to count how many strokes the penguin took on its journey. It's pretty, pretty incredible. The work is very rewarding. It's new information. We didn't know it before. Certainly as a polar species, they're gonna be some of the first that will be affected by climate change. They show up at the breeding season and the ice isn't there, so they have nowhere to breed. So that probably is gonna be happening more and more frequently where we're gonna be losing chicks just due to ice going away. Some of the best things you can do is just reduce your carbon footprint. And just caring about biodiversity is important and protecting that biodiversity. And penguins, especially these penguins, are sentinels of change. They're sort of the canaries in the coal mine. All right, coming up, meet a five-year-old with cerebral palsy who's learning how to navigate life from a role model who has the very same muscular disorder. I hope Colby just finds her real voice. She's capable of doing anything. I just hope that it's part of her and that she's proud of it because if I could go back to that five-year-old girl, I would doubt her. <laughs> if, if I could go back to my five-year-old self, I would tell her to be proud of herself. A five-year-old with cerebral palsy found an important friend and role model in a fitness coach who also has that very same muscular disorder. The two live in different parts of the country, but CBS News was there when they finally got together and met in person for the very first time. Here's Elaine Quijano. Now I can pour some orange juice in it. Okay. Like other five-year-olds, Colby Durbaro spends a lot of time in a world of make-believe. Here you go. Thank you so much. But her reality has differed since birth. Colby was born 17 weeks premature at one pound, two ounces. She's faced a host of health challenges since, including the muscular disorder cerebral palsy, or CP. CP is where you have, like, CP and, and you use, like, a walker, a cane, and a wheelchair. These days, Colby is realizing that others sometimes see her differently. She said, Mommy, I don't like when people stare at me. Mommy, I don't like it. I want them to stop. I want Colby to know that she can pick up the phone and call me for whatever reason. Steph Roach was also born with CP. She and Colby's mom, Amanda, met through social media, where Roach, a former CrossFit trainer and book author, posts about her life and defying expectations. When I saw Colby and then I saw the way that Amanda was guiding Colby through life, it was just like we were meant to, to be friends. Until now, it's been a long-distance friendship. The Durboros in New Jersey and Roach in Arizona. You ready? Come on yeah. out. But one January morning... Who is it? They had their first meeting. Guess what? The yeah. camera people here. And guess what? I got, I got the same thing as you. I know, it's so cool. They were immediately comfortable with each other. Can I pick you up? You're the best stuff. I can't believe you, like you're here. Oh. I, love you. I love you. Colby realizes that people are starting to look at her and see her maybe a little bit differently. So we've had some big conversations about how that might make her feel. And Yeah, I, I, I know all about how I feel now. Is it okay it? to tell somebody that you don't like it? Yeah. We have to be nice about it. Yeah. But you can still tell somebody that I don't really like how you stare at me like that. If you have questions, I can answer them for you, right? Yeah. If people have questions, they can ask you. After Colby went to play, Roach remembered her own childhood. I wanted to be as, quote, normal as possible, but it really wasn't until I turned probably 20, 22, where I really started to own who I was. With self-acceptance came new chapters, a growing circle of friends, success in fitness competitions, and love. Is it true you met Tyler on Tinder? It is very true. And I remember telling him, you know, hope this doesn't bother you, but I have CP. And he said, well, I'm pigeon-toed, so I hope that doesn't bother you. Just months into their relationship, her life changed again. 
during a doctor's visit in 2016. And these lumps were all throughout my body and a couple weeks later, I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma stage 3B. It took 12 rounds of chemotherapy before doctors said her scans were clear. Steph and Ty have since married and faced the outside world together. We've been in a grocery store and a man has literally come up to him and shaken his hand and said like, so good of you to be with her. And like, why isn't he lucky to also be with me? She can't stand when she's a wheelchair for me. Yeah. What would your hope for Colby be? Gosh, I mean, so many things. Uh, you know, as a mom, you just have all the hope in the world. You know, I used to think that because she had CP, she would be an artist because she couldn't be an athlete. And now I know that the world is her oyster. My hope is that she's exactly who she wants to be. And Steph. I hope Colby just finds her real voice. She's capable of doing anything. I just hope that it's part of her and that she's proud of it. Because if I could go back to that five-year-old girl, I would doubt her. <laughs> if, if I could go back to my five-year-old self, I would tell her to be proud of herself. At the end of the day, it's all about that human connection. It's a beautiful story, Elaine. Thank you very much. That is our show. I'm confident it brightened your day, lifted you up. If for some reason it didn't, the reruns, they do remain free. Meantime, I'm going to go find some good news.